I love my church, and I do, and I hope you do too, because God has great things in store for this church and for his church in the world today. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on this message. Heavenly Father, Lord, you say that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, Lord, we're asking that as your word goes forth today, uh, may my words that I speak be living and active, not because they're just my words, but because they're infused with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we open ourselves to your activity in our lives. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of our hearts, wherever we're at in our journey with you. And Lord, speak to us, remind us of the things that we need to be doing or remind us of the things that we should stop doing. Remind us of the truth, of the priorities of what our life should be and our activity uh, involved with you and your kingdom. So Lord, we pray that you'll speak and as your servants are listening, we pray that we would be doers of the word and not just hearers. We ask your blessing on this message in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I, I don't know uh, who or what you have a heart for in this world today. Who or what do you have a heart for? For me, I, I told you I love Thanksgiving. I love good food. I love the people in my family. We weren't able to have our kids this year because of other circumstances, but we had extended family. So our table was still full and blessed and there was a lot of laughter and yes, I even got to play my favorite card game at the end of the evening with family that was so great. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I'm blessed to do life together with these guys, especially being up here in Northern California, that we got to have a Northern California kind of a Thanksgiving with some of Lisa's family members. Um, I love Mexican food. I don't know if you do, if you can say que bueno. Uh, Buenas enchiladas and all that other stuff, but that's one of the things that I love. Um, I love uh, sports. Uh, basketball season is coming up, college basketball. March Madness will be in just a few months, but my Wichita State Shockers are ranked number six in the country, and they are, they are poised to make a run in the tournament, so I'm excited about that. I love frozen yogurt. I think Lisa and I get that at least twice a week. Go up there and get my toppings, my almonds and my chocolate chips. And Lisa's found this place that has toasted coconuts. So she's giddy about frozen yogurt and going those places. But those are just some of those lower level things that I have a heart for. What's, a, what's something that I have a deeper place in my heart for? And one of, the pla one of the things for that for me is I have a heart for this church. You guys are filled, this church, with some amazing, gifted, godly, Christ-loving people that it's been awesome to become friends with you, to get to know you, to come to respect you and your walk with God. Um, one of the things, the way you take care of homeless people, just for example, every week is just, a, is just astounding. It's, a, it's an amazing blessing for them and for me to watch and to, to participate in that just a little bit. So I, I have a great heart for this church, for this house of worship. And I wonder, do you have a heart for this house of worship? Uh, beyond uh, just a passing fancy or just beyond just a, yeah, this is a place that I go to occasionally on the weekend. Uh, is this something that is deep into your heart? Because I want us, us to see this morning just how much God values his church, how much uh, God has a heart for this house of worship. And this local congregation, for the church, yes, universal, but also for this local uh, house of worship. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look in the book of Ephesians. I invite you to turn in your New Testaments, in your Bible, the book of Ephesians. Uh, Regina's got a Bible right there. You can find it. If you get, it, if you get to it, Ephesians chapter 2, can you shout out the page? That would be good for us to know. You'll see some of the scriptures up on the board, but some people like to look in a you know, a handheld Bible that's not powered by batteries. And some people like their smartphones, so you're good either way. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19 today. Um, let me just give you a little background. Uh, it's talking about how uh, the Gentiles used to walk in darkness. The Gentiles, the, those, of a, those who were not Jewish people in the first century, 
that they were, because they were not Jewish people, they were not chosen by God to, to be specially blessed by him. And so according to the Jewish people, the Gentiles were the outsiders. They were the foreigners. They were the dogs. They were the uncircumcised. They, were, they had all these derogatory names for them to say that, look, we, that we Jews, we belong to God's family. We're in the privileged group. And you Gentiles, just by the fact that you were not born a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, you don't belong to God's family. And Paul was saying that when Jesus came, he changed all that. When Jesus died on the cross, he broke down that dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And what he made a new pathway was for one new race of people to come in. Jewish on one side, Gentile on the other side, to come into one new race of God's people who belong to God's family now, not because of their birth or because of their race. They belong to God's family because of a decision that each of us have made individually, a decision to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And when we have done that, God says that we are now made members of God's family. And so for Gentiles who were considered outside God's family for generations, they could be now in, uh, become members of God's family. So look what it says here in verse 19. Paul, the apostle, is writing this to the church in Ephesus, and he says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. You know, that word household literally means members of the family. So you weren't members of God's family before, but now in Christ you are members of God's family, whether you were Jewish by background or whether you were Gentile by background. You don't have to enter God's family by keeping the law of Moses. You don't have to enter God's family by keeping some other law of righteousness that maybe the Gentiles would have invented to say, this is how you live, this is how you're in a right relationship with God. We're all sinners. The Bible says that whether we're Jew or Gentile, we were all under sin, but we were saved by grace in Christ. We were all brought by faith into the same family. And now God is making this, and, and this was revolutionary in the first century. Out of two people who were, two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, who were enmity with each other, they hated each other. They have now been brought in under the same banner of Christ. And so we are fellow members of God's household, fellow citizens with God's people. Jews and Gentiles, though they were far apart, they didn't get along with each other at all, yet their common faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah and masters, now we find ourselves as fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. Now, what is this kingdom built upon? What is the foundation of this kingdom? The next verse explains that. This kingdom of God is built, the church, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. You might notice that we just sang a song about Christ alone, cornerstone, right? You think that was any accident? Michael tell you, no, Jim called me up on Monday and asked me to sing that song. I asked him to put that song in there to remind us as we sang that, that the reason that we have this foundation and being assured that we're in God's family is because Christ is our cornerstone. But apart from Christ or along with Christ is the chief cornerstone, that, that foundational uh, piece of slab that makes the foundation true and solid to build upon. We're also built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It wasn't built with human hands. It wasn't built with brick or mortar or stone or plaster or drywall or two by fours, it was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Our spiritual heritage is handed down to us by the apostles of Jesus Christ and the prophets of the Christian church. What we have today in the New Testament, we have the eyewitness testimony. We have the writings, letters, gospels that apostles and prophets of Jesus Christ have written and they collected these writings together, the four Gospels and 13 letters of Paul and other letters, pastoral letters of Paul and letters to the churches. And finally, this apocalyptic revelation of how the world is going to end and where we see no matter what your, your particular view is on Revelation, God wins at the end, right? 
that God wins at the end and we're part of the victory. Um, that spiritual heritage was all collected together in this group of documents put together in 27 books that we now call the New Testament. And so the foundation that we have, we can actually read about any time you want to read it. And we're encouraging. We always say, you know, chapter a day, talking about the Bible, chapter a day keeps the devil away, right? In the sense that as we read God's word, we're learning God's revelation to us every single day. And that's why we encourage a devotional. That's why we provide a devotional. By the way, coming up to the end of November, there are new devotionals out if you want to pick one up after the service today. So we have the apostles' eyewitness testimony. We have their teachings written down in the New Testament. And these documents are what guide us as a church today. There are, they are our highest authority for governing our faith and our practice. You remember what the early church did, right? Do you remember like Jessica was talking about getting baptized here? So they believed the apostles' message. They turned from their faith and repentance. And the early believers on that first day of Pentecost, they were baptized. They were immersed uh, into Jesus Christ. And then it says right afterwards, okay, now that they're new believers, how do they grow? And it says they devoted themselves. And the first thing they said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And that's what this church has to be known for. That's how we're going to build this church. That's how the foundation is going to be built up. On the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Building them up with the, with the written documents, the Holy Spirit inspired scriptures so that we can grow and develop in our faith. And the Bible actually says, you know what? We ought to have, we ought to have the same attitude towards God's word as a newborn baby has towards milk. And, and in fact, it says in 1 Peter, like newborn babes crave the pure spiritual milk of the word. I don't know how much you're craving God's word in your life. Maybe, you're, maybe you've gotten kind of cold in that. Maybe that's not a big priority for you. But I want to say, you say, God, I want to grow in my faith. I don't want to just remain right where I am. If you want to grow in your faith, you don't grow just because another 24 hours passes on the calendar. You grow not day by day. We grow word by word. So we need to keep growing together as God's family, as fellow citizens of God's people. We need to grow on the foundation and the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. Now, what does it say about Christ himself? The next verse, it says, in him, talking about Christ Jesus and talking about this building that God is now calling the church. The church, meaning the assembly. The church, meaning the gathering of God's people. And that's what we're doing this morning. To collectively, this is what this whole building we call the church is doing. In Christ Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. You know, before Jesus came along, before the New Testament came along, and before the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, only one generation after Jesus was crucified and buried and rose again in Jerusalem, only a generation after that, this magnificent temple rebuilt by Herod, took, says 46 years it took to build this temple, and you say you're going to rebuild it in three days? But Jesus said it. he wasn't talking about the physical temple, he was talking about his physical body. So he says, I'm going to rebuild the temple. So Jesus is already changing the, the language around to say, look, when we're talking about the temple now, we're not just talking about a place, a physical place in Jerusalem where the priests would go and offer these sacrifices every day. That temple's been wiped out. It was wiped out by the Romans. There's no more physical temple to go to. So when it says that we are becoming a holy temple in the Lord, I think it's talking about two things. It's talking about you and I individually being a temple where God resides through the Holy Spirit, through the indwelling Holy Spirit. We're a temple of the Lord, but then it's also talking about collectively. Collectively, as a church body, we are also a temple of the Lord that he is building in this house of faith, in this house of worship. And so I'll just say it, 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 it didn't just occur to me. I've been thinking about this a lot. We need to do our best to be in church every week. And if for no other reason you say, well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not getting a lot out of church, or maybe the worship doesn't do it for me, or maybe the message doesn't do it for me, or maybe, you know, this or that, it's just not, you know, as exciting as it was in the past or whatever. If that's your attitude, I just want to encourage you, try to have a new perspective. 
Try to have a perspective that when you and I come to church, that I'm not just looking to receive. I'm not just looking to be fed. I'm coming to church. I am blessed by God so that I can be a blessing to other people. And I hope you would have the same attitude. So I want to be at church every week because there is somebody at church that God wants to use me to bless them, wants to use me to encourage them, to pray for them, to help them if they need a word of wisdom, if they need advice, if they need a shoulder to cry on. We need to be here so that we can build each other up in the body of Christ. And it says the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. This church... Uh, it says, the, the Bible says this in Psalm 84. It says, better is one day in your courts. You remember he's singing that praise song? Better is one day in your courts. Uh, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. New Living Translation says, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. This church needs to be God's house of hope. This needs to be a place where we are all open to God's activity in our lives. And this house of hope has open hearts and we have open hands to serve other people like we're going to do in the next few weeks, uh, picking a, a name of a child off that Christmas tree that's going to be in the back starting next week for Schaefer Elementary School. I love those shirts, by the way. That was cool. Cool ch color choice too, navy blue. That was inspired, you know. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I've seen Sonoma, you guys have seen this all over, all over the county, Sonoma Strong, Sonoma Strong, right? And they put Schaefer Strong, and I like that. I like that. It's like we are rising, They're, this Operation Phoenix, man, they are literally rising from the ashes in that school. So that's awesome. The, to open hands, open hearts to serve other people, people we don't even know. You remember when Jesus called Simon Peter? We talked about that a few weeks ago in Luke chapter 5. When he, when he called him into full-time discipleship. And he says, you know, Peter said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, no, forget all that. I've forgiven you. From now on, I'm going to teach you to catch men. You're going to become fishers of men when you follow me. And since none of those disciples, by the way, that was Simon Peter. And he, had a, he was a great character, but he certainly had his flaws. I think all 12 of those disciples uh, definitely had their flaws. I don't think any of them was a first round draft pick, if you know what I mean. I think those guys had major problems. There was two brothers who had a major temper tantrum. You know, they're in a Samaritan village. They try to go in there. A Samaritan village doesn't receive them. They come back to Jesus and they said, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven on these guys, just like Sodom and Gomorrah for, for their disobedience and not receiving uh, Jesus uh, as a teacher, as a rabbi, potentially as Messiah. You, they're rejecting you. Should we just call down fire from heaven? I can imagine Jesus going, wow, I've got a long way to go. I've got, got a long way to go with these guys, right? Um, but the great thing about Jesus, I mean, there was political revolutionaries. They were, there was a selfish tax collector. They were argumentative. I mean, on, on the night... The night that Jesus was going to be arrested and give his life for them, when he had done all this teaching with them in the upper room, they started out the evening. They were arguing with themselves over, over who was going to be greater in the kingdom of heaven. So there's their mentality. And, and yet the great thing is Jesus never gave up on them. Jesus never lost hope in them. Jesus never threw in the towel on them as they, because he knew they would continue to follow him. And Jesus, because of that, he never gave up on them. He was able to transform them into genuine servant leaders and world changers. Jesus, here's the great thing about Jesus. He never focuses on what people are like in the present. Jesus always focuses on what you and I can become. Isn't that a great perspective? I wish that I could do that better. Because sometimes I look at people and I say, well, that's the way they are. They'll never change. You know? In other words, as if people have no ability to, to change their personality, have no idea, they have no ability to change the values that they have and to, and to start you know, letting go of worldly values and, letting, and embracing godly values, Jesus has the ability to transform somebody from the inside out. As we, again, now we're 
getting back to God's word, as we're letting God's word infuse itself into our lives, it's going to start changing us from the inside out. We're going to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, and Jesus is going to start having his way more and more with us to where we're going to be that kind of holy temple as a church collective here. We're going to be that kind of holy temple that Jesus is, is going to be more and more pleased with. He's going to be more and more proud of as we serve him and as we serve one another. There's great hope for us in this local church. Look what it says in verse 22. In him, in Christ Jesus, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And so God is now making his home in the church, in his body, the body of Christ. And so I ask yourself, as you see, Jesus is making his home among us, his dwelling, he's blessing us, he's building us up through his spirit, do you have a heart for the house? Do you have a heart for the community of faith that Jesus is building? Because God is living in this new building of people. So because we have Jesus, because we have his Holy Spirit, because we have God's word, the Bible, to show us what to believe, to show us the best path to follow our Lord and Savior, then we, can't, we don't just have to hope for, we can also expect. We can expect a better future because the Lord himself promises that he's going to lead us and guide us. So one of the questions for us is, okay, how? You want us to grow together. You want us to have a bigger heart for God's house. How can we have a bigger heart for God's house? How can our hearts be knit together so that we move together in unity and when we move together in unity, the Bible says there the Lord commands a blessing. Psalm 133. How can we move together to build his church? This is how we're going to grow and be healthy. We're going to go down to two more chapters in Ephesians. It's probably one page over. Do you remember what page you were on, Regina, or did you put your Bible down? I put my Bible down. It's on the screen. Anyway, what now? 1174. In the Holy Spirit version over there, it's 1174. It might be a different page. What do you have, Donna? Okay, 815, 1174, depending on the Bible, all right? But it's also on the screen. How can our hearts grow for God's house? Look what it says in Ephesians 4. Instead, in other words, instead as in not acting like it said the way in the few verses before because Paul was talking about, you know, we need to have God's people, God's gifted leaders build up the church so that we'll all grow together in the unity of the faith, so that we'll be mature, so that we won't be tossed back and forth like the winds and the waves, like people who don't know God's word, like people who just get blown around by every wind of teaching and doctrine, where they come up and they say, oh, it says this in a, in a Time magazine about Jesus, or it says this about that, or the society is saying this about the church and the faith, and we say, you know what? All, that, all those opinions aside, our highest rule of faith and practice is going to be right here in God's word, the Bible. Because there's the revelation that God, the timeless revelation where God promises that he's going to infuse his Holy Spirit into that living and active word and it's going to transform us from the inside out. So it says, how do we grow in our faith? It says, instead, instead of getting blown around by every wind of doctrine, instead, speaking the truth in love, and by the way, any good marriage ought to put that Phrase right there in a practice, speaking the truth in love to each other, right? I think when marriages, when any good relationship, when we get off track, we do one but not the other, or maybe we don't even do both, right? We lie and we don't have love, or we speak truth to each other, but it's so harsh and cold and there's no love mixed in, or we just love the other person and we never say what needs to be said in, in order to remedy the relationship. So, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every aspect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So what is Paul saying our goal is? We're going to grow. We're going to become the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, because he is the head of the church, Jesus. We are his body, the church. I mean, that is a very organic uh, uh, spiritual relationship that Paul is talking about there. We're going to grow together as we speak the truth in love. We have to maintain that healthy combination because if all you do is speak the truth but you have no love, you know what you are? You're an ogre. You're a cold-blooded legalist. 
all truth and no love. And what if all you have is love? If all you do is love someone and never speak the truth of what they're doing or the wrong direction they're going or how they're not living up to God's standard, you're not really helping that person either. All you're doing is enabling the bad behavior that they're exhibiting. So we have to practice both. We have to speak the truth in love. And when we get it right, for example, can you, evan can you really evangelize somebody without speaking the truth in love? I just want to love everybody. Well, if you love everybody without any truth, then you're never going to want to offend anybody. So you're never going to say anything that might be thought of as offensive to them. So you might not actually get to the point of saying, hey, Jesus died for our sins on the cross and he wants us to put our faith and trust in him. And the Bible actually says, Peter says it in Acts chapter four, he says, salvation is found in nobody else. There's no one else under heaven whom God has given by which we must be saved. You know, to some people that could be offensive. But if I didn't say that, I wouldn't be speaking the truth in love. Because love, according to agape love, that means I'm acting in the best interest of that other person. And the best interest of that other person, what is it? To be in a saving relationship with Christ. That's their best interest. To be heaven bound, to, be, to have the life of God, to have the abundant life that Jesus talks about by following him. I want that for everybody. So I have to speak the truth in love in order to evangelize, in order to share the Christian faith with other people. When we get it right, when we have that right combination of truth and love, we will grow. Look what it says in verse 16. It says, from him, talking about Jesus. Wow, I've got to remember to make my font bigger. Okay. Uh, from him, Christ Jesus, the whole body, talking about the church now, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament. You know, you kind of wonder, was Luke right next to Paul, Luke the doctor? And Paul le leaned over and he says, hey, how does this work? Pa how does this work, Luke? And he says, well, you know, there's, they've got these ligaments and these joints and, and how they stretch with one another and they work together. And Paul's like, ooh, I like that. I'm going to use that. So, <laughs> so he talks about the spiritual body, almost like an analogy to the physical body. And he says the whole body of Christ joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love just as each part does its work, right? So the whole body growing, that's us, that's the church. And there's two ways it says it, it talks about growing and it talks about building itself up in love. Growing is a numerical term. That just means more people. That means that God wants his house full. That means that God doesn't want any empty seats in church. He wants to see everybody worshiping him uh, when we gather together on the weekends. So he wants more people. He w that's a numerical term, the church grows. But then there's a, not just a quantity term, there's also this quality term where it says that not only do we grow numerically, we grow spiritually, so it builds itself up in love. That's a quality improvement. That means we're getting more and more collectively, we're getting more and more like Jesus. That means collectively, when we have an opportunity to be Jesus' hands and feet, for example, to Schaefer Elementary School, there are gonna be more and more people that are just gonna say, thank God we have that opportunity to help those people. Thank God we have the ability to show Jesus' love to them. I want in, how can I help? What can I do to help? When more and more people just have that, that, that response instead of, oh boy, here's another need. Oh boy, here's another, you know, something I have to do. Uh, you, know, you, you know the difference in your attitude when you first hear something like that. Opportunity or eh, inconvenience, right? Yes, when we love other people, it is going to be inconvenience because loving other people requires that we sacrifice. Loving other people requires we have to pay attention a little less to ourself. And when we pay a little less attention to ourselves, guess what? We become more and more selfless. <laughs> when I think of our church, Sebastopol Christian Church, I think of two churches. I think of the church as we are right now. And I also think in the future, as God works in us and God works through us and God blesses us and we, we act like the church and we're learning and growing together, there's the church that we are, and then there's also the church that we can become. And the kind of church that we can become is just this beautiful expression of Christ as you know, doing what he wants us to do as his hands and feet in our community. Look, at, if you could imagine our church, 
uh, and, and we're doing some of this in some degree already, but think of this in even more exponential degrees. Imagine our church where the broken come in and they find healing in this place. Imagine a church where we extend grace to every person, no matter how messy their lives seem to be. Imagine a church where lonely people can come in and find real, lasting friends and community. Where families can build and flourish together in multiple generations. Imagine a church where injustice is put on notice. Where we're not just going to ignore it or lament it or say that's really sad. We need to pray for those people. Sometimes we need to do something about it to remedy the injustice. And some of our mission programs are doing that. Imagine that we're going to extend compassion. Imagine a church where the oppressed can come in and find freedom. Who wouldn't want to be part of a church like that? Not just the church that we are, but the church that we can become. You know, one time Jesus was sitting down. He was having a meal with people. And this is in Luke chapter 14 in Luke's gospel. And I think I have these, this up here. So Jesus is telling a story at a dinner gathering. And a lot of times Jesus was invited to have a dinner at the home of a Pharisee. And a Pharisee was a really strict Jewish person at the time. They were really like, look, we're God's chosen people. We're the one who keeps God's laws. All those other people are riffraff. Uh, God loves us. God hates them. It had a real us and them mentality. And Jesus is trying to break that as he's doing his teaching. And so he tells the story. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Now, just a little background in that culture. There were sort of two invitations that went out because back then it took a lot of time to prepare the food because they didn't have microwaves. <laughs> <laughs> which is, that's my principal uh, cooking utensil, the nuker, the microwave. Okay, so, so, but because it took a while to prepare the food, they would send out an invitation, hey, on this particular day, I'm going to have a banquet, I want to invite you to come. And then a second invitation would come and say, hey, the food is almost ready, please, you know, gather yourself together and come on over to my house, right? So it's sort of a two-prong invitation. So it says, come, for everything is now ready. The next slide, please. But they all alike, now these are the people who had received the original invitation, probably didn't RSVP, and now they're receiving that second notice that's saying, look, the food is almost ready, the banquet is being prepared, make your way to the banquet table over at the master's house. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, oh, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me, like the field won't be there when you get done eating, come on. I, another said, I have just brought, I've just bought the five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Okay, like the oxen won't be there either. And still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. All right, I'm not going to touch that one. Because <laughs> uh, there's other things in the Bible about when somebody gets married, you know, let them alone for a year. You know, let them be happy together. So, but anyway, uh, according to Jesus, him telling the story, these were three excuses and the implication is they were kind of unacceptable reasons for not going to the banquet. And so what is the reaction of the master? So now the master says, next slide please. The servant came back and reported this to his master and then the owner of the house became angry. Hmm. Angry at what? Angry at the refusal of the invitation. I, I, I did all this for you. I invited you to my banquet. I wanted you to come and you won't even come. And now I'm going to have to find other people to come to this banquet. So the owner of the house ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets, into the byways and the highways and invite everyone there. Right? So then the servant comes back. He reports this to the master. Uh, uh, okay. You know, invite and look at the kind of people that says now, you know, these were all these other people that were invited at first, but they refused to come. So now who is the master inviting? He says, go out into the town and the alleys and the streets, bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Doesn't sound like all the winners of society to me. 
Sounds like the kind of people God is, is intending to reach. Maybe their hearts would be open to him. Maybe their hearts would be open, more open to their own spiritual need inside where they'd say, yeah, I'll, I would accept an invitation to follow Christ. And so now at the end, he says, I think there's one more scripture. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. That's what I love about the master. When there's still room, you know, there's always room for one more right? The master told his servant, go out into the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. What do you think the master's intention is when he has a gathering, when he has a feast? You know, he, he's invited us to his banqueting table, his banner over us is love, right? So he's inviting us to his table and he says, so that my house will be full. You know, I, I don't know if you've replied to Jesus' invitation yet or not. Friends, I know that some of you have been attending, some of you have been here, some of you have been slightly resisting or maybe delaying your response to Jesus' invitation to fully follow him, to surrender your self-driven life and to put him on the throne of your life and to follow him fully. Maybe you're still waiting uh, for some reason and your excuses that you have right now Maybe to you and your own heart and mind, maybe they sound reasonable, but to Jesus, it says you don't want to make, you don't want to make the master angry. Maybe they're family issues or work responsibilities or relational needs, but you know what? No matter where you are, God's invitation to you today, that is the most important invitation that you will ever receive. That becomes right now the priority in your life. And he wants you, Jesus wants you to respond to his invitation with a yes. Yes, you will respond and attend his banquet. You will join his kingdom family. According to this parable, the way I understand it, you don't have forever to respond and you don't want to miss it. You keep saying no or not now or maybe later to God's invitation and there may be a time in the future when he pulls away his invitation from you and offers it to somebody else. So that it, at that time, then it would be too late for you to get into his dinner party. The Bible says, now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. You do not want to miss it. So that my house will be full. Look at that pronoun there. This is something that it reminds me as a pastor. That should remind us as elders or board members or church leaders. Jesus says, Compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Whose house is it? It's, it's God's house. It belongs to him. He died for it. He paid for it with his own blood when he gave his life on the cross. So it's his house. He wants his house full. This church belongs to our Lord and head and master, Jesus Christ, and he wants his house full. And Jesus doesn't stay away from messy people. Actually, he runs toward them. God's heart and God's house are for everyone. Everyone needs to have a forgiving, vibrant, saving relationship with our Savior Jesus. It's one of the reasons, by the way, in three weeks, one of the reasons why we're putting on a Christmas show. It's called Journey to Christmas. Maybe you saw the sign uh, to it when you walked in. I couldn't find the holes outside on the street, so I just brought it in here and I said, well, we can look at it today. But I want to get it outside because the point of that banner is it's not just for us to know that there's a Journey for Christmas show coming December 16 and 17. That show is, is for everyone. That show is for our community. And people, whether you know it or not, people are more likely, especially between Thanksgiving and Christmas, for some reason, the way God works, more people are open spiritually at that time of year than just about any other year. And they would accept an invitation to a Christmas show, especially if it's not during the time of a normal church service. They would accept an invitation more often than not. And so we have invitations. We have our signs coming. God says that he wants his house full so that my house, his house, can be full. That's why we're doing that. We want to be a life-giving church where broken people find healing, where lonely people find lasting friends, where families can grow and flourish, where we will extend compassion and start eradicating injustice, 
where the oppressed find freedom. We want all those things. And God wants that even more than we do. And he wants to do that. He wants to do all those kinds of great changes in this world in us and through us because we are God's house collectively. And we need to have a heart for his house. That's why you need, I hope that you'll have this attitude where you say, I love my church. I love my church as imperfect as it is, as flawed as it is. This is the vehicle that God says he's using to build his kingdom through local congregations like this one right here in Sebastopol. So let's do what God has called us to do. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as we're at this time of year where we're transitioning out of Thanksgiving and into the Christmas season, Lord, we recognize that people are more open spiritually to you. So, God, we pray that our hearts would be on the lookout for them. We pray that we'd be open to reaching people who are still outside your family. Remind us, Lord, at one time we were among those who were the spiritually poor and the blind and the crippled and the lame. And yet you extended your invitation to us. And thank you that we were able to hear your invitation and to turn away from whatever it was we were, direction we were going. And we chose to follow you. And now we're in your family. And so Lord, help us to be blessed by you so we too can be a blessing to other people. Lord, give us, thank you for the nice seat that we have at your table. But now help us as your people and prompt us to love others whom we know, to invite them here to your church. Lord, we ask that you'd go before us even now and work upstream in their lives. Lord, work in their hearts so that they will be open to an invitation and accept it. And when they do come, Lord, whoever you bring, Lord, help us to be welcoming and loving and receiving to all those people, no matter how messy that on the outside their lives may seem. And Lord, while our eyes are still closed today and our heads are bowed, I just want to remind you that if you are ready to accept Christ's invitation to follow him, if you're ready to become his followers, then pray along with me. Pray, just pray the prayer, something like this. Lord Jesus, I come to you today in humility. I come to you today in faith. I thank you for dying for my sins when you gave your life on the cross. Thank you for showing me how to have a right, forgiven relationship with my heavenly Father, with God through you. And Lord, I ask you to cleanse me from all the wrong things that I've said or done. Forgive me. God, and wipe my slate clean. Show me how to live my life to reflect the way that you want me to live so I can love you with all my heart and I can love my neighbor as myself. Lord, today I receive your forgiveness. I receive your Holy Spirit by faith into my life right now. And I give you all the praise, God. I give you all the honor and the glory for what you've done in, in me. And I pray, Lord, make me one of those pillars in your church. Make me one of those building blocks where your church continues to grow and flourish because I'm doing my part as a member of this church family. Help me to do my part to grow this church body. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.